I would now like to introduce our first speaker to the stage, Professor Kwa Chung Guan. Professor Kwa is an adjunct associate professor at the History Department of NUS and also a senior fellow at NTU School of International Studies. Kwa, Professor Kwa's work focuses on the intersection between history, security, and international relations in Southeast Asia. He has made valuable contributions to the study of pre-colonial Singapore and, and its historiography as co-editor, along with Professor Borschberg, of the book 700 Years and Studying Singapore Before 1800. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kwa to the stage. First, I ask you to join me in thanking Mr. Matthew Ui for organizing this conference. It's a tribute to his uh, enthusiasm, his work, that he has brought it all together here. Please do join me to thank him. Especially since he's done this, I think, largely from overseas, out of Singapore. So it's quite a feat to have brought us all together. And I think with a younger group of historians like him and others in the group, the history, the writing of Singapore's history is assured now. Um, initially, I had uh, turned down Mr. Wee's invitation. Uh, as I didn't have the time, but I was persuaded by my colleague, Peter Borschberg, whom we do hear afterwards, and had met uh, Mr. Wee and his parents over dinner that, yes, this is a venture worth supporting. And second, when uh, my old colleague and older friend, John Mixick, uh, became unable to speak on this issue of archaeology, and really, he should be the one standing here, not me. He's the archaeologist, not me. Then uh, I realized that someone had to rise the occasion, and I'm afraid you will have to hear me out on what archaeology has contributed to the writing of Singapore history. And third, when I saw the list of participants, speakers, well, this is a great conference to be in, especially when he has got none other than our guru, our mentor, uh, Professor Wang Gangu, to grace the occasion and join us here. So I'm sorry that uh, Professor Mixik is unable to join us, but as you can see, his uh, award in this year's National Day uh, is tribute, the, an acknowledgement that archaeology may finally have got a place in the writing of Singapore history. And uh, this to acknowledge that we are delighted that in 1983, he accepted our invitation to conduct the first archaeological survey of Fort Canning to check uh, whether there was any remains of the 14th century settlement that Raffles and John Crawford saw in 1819. And this was, as with all archaeology in Singapore, uh, rescue archaeology, salvage archaeology, before the area, the site, was redeveloped. And in this case here, uh, Tourism Board was about to dig up Fort Canning. So uh, the chances of finding anything was slim. The hill had been considerably uh, disturbed, uh, by, principally by the uh, developments there, the digging up for a Fort Canning, and then in the 20th century, the uh, reservoir and the underground command center of the British in World War II. So really, it was against the odds that we found an undisturbed 14th century layer on Fort Canning. And it was a justification to argue for the preservation of Fort Canning as a historic site and to conduct further excavations. And this is the report that uh, Mixic produced of his dig. The 
iconic uh, gold banglet that we have found in 1928, and I draw your attention to this blue and white and these earthenware. Uh, we found a number of these, but we are still not clear what they are. We think they are parts of roof tile. This is the earthenware stuff, which I will be describing, and the green saladons and the green and the shards of the green of the heavy storage jars. And this is Fort Canning, as you would see it today. I would assume that most of you are familiar, but uh, what we did in 1984 was, okay, we followed uh, Dr. Crawford, John Crawford's description of what he saw. Crawford was a careful observer. He left very clear uh, <clears throat> directions and descriptions that we were able to locate what he was talking about, uh, despite the big, sorry, despite that big reservoir which now still dominates Fort Canning. Uh, 1926, it was dug and water from uh, Gunung Pulai in Johor was shipped directly, packed in directly to the town. So we did some, a couple of trenches here, a couple there, or nothing. And what we struck, when we struck gold or dirt was around here. Uh, Dr. Crawford had said that the Kramat was still there and we figured that maybe around there we could find something. And uh, we did. Um, this is a 19, 1825 map, which Dr. John Crawford probably, you know, was uh, using an earlier version of. So this is Fort Canning. This is where the Black Staff was erected and Raffles had his bungalow, which John Crawford inherited and took over. And note this one here. Mark here is the old lines of Singapore. It is a earthen embankment rampart that both uh, Raffles and Crawford saw. It was some uh, 10 feet high at that point of time. So really, we are talking about this as the limits of uh, the settlement in the 14th century. There. And the site at the, near the Kramat has today been preserved, and you can see there the uh, stratigraphy, quite well preserved, and behind there is, the, uh, is a display of, what, of the history of the site and what has been found that Dr. Mixick has uh, put up there with the support of the Parks Board. So, that was in 1984, and thereafter, we did further excavations for the next uh, 30 years, principally around that uh, Stanford Canal where the uh, earth embankment ran. So we did excavations whenever there was uh, plans to renovate the site at St. Andrew's Cathedral, uh, Colombo Court, when there were plans to build a new Supreme Court there, uh, Parliament House, the old Parliament House, when they were about to redevelop it. And uh, along right near the Singapore River, when we were planning and redesigning this new Asian Civilization Museum. Uh, more recently, we have had uh, developed a new area, marine archaeology, when in between uh, 2015 and 2022, what happened was that in 2014, I think, a barge towing a crane to Malaysia ran aground on Pedra Branca. Pedra Branca, of course, as you realize, is some distance from Singapore out in the South China Sea there. Uh, Pedra Branca, then Middle Rocks, and then South Ledge. So, uh, in the course of salvaging the uh, sunken barge and crane, the divers found a pile of uh, shards, plates, which one of them recognized as something he saw in the museum. And he brought it to ISIS, where my colleague, our colleague, Dr. Mike Flecker, 
and others had no difficulty recognizing, wow, this is 14th century Longchuan ware. And so uh, Jai there confirmed that certainly there was a wreck there and permission, and more important, the funding to excavate the wreck was secured. And from 2015, we excavated the wreck uh, and confirmed it was a 14th century ship. We don't know whether it's Chinese or Southeast Asian or Middle Eastern, but we recovered 4.4 tons of ceramics from that wreck. And after that, a further survey found another wreck in that vicinity. Um, but the first wreck was there, the second wreck was somewhere there, 300 uh, meters north of the rocks itself. Uh, the second wreck was a later 18th century, what we call a country trader, owned by an Indian ship owner there. Uh, I will not touch on this here now for time, but we can go into it if you're interested later. So, Pedro Branca is, of course, a well-known shipping hazard. This is a sketch of it drawn by John Thompson, the architect, hydrographer, mapper who designed and built the uh, lighthouse on Pedro Branca here. And this is the excavation in progress. This one, for those of you who know your Chinese porcelain, immediately recognize is not 14th century. This is from the 18th century wreck. It's a Qing dynasty uh, blue and white production. And here we have the man who did it, who conducted and supervised the excavations, uh, Dr. Mike Flecker. And uh, here he is displaying some of the 4.4 tons of stuff. Uh, we only got one complete piece out of that wreck, this one there. Uh, is displayed downstairs now in the uh, ground floor of this uh, museum. There were other complete pieces, but while the excavation was in progress, the site was also being looted by uh, antique divers from Indonesia and elsewhere. And we know that for a fact because these pieces that were looted have appeared in the New York dealers and it's quite clearly stated there from a wreck in Singapore waters. <laughs> yeah. So there you see what we recovered, the green Long Chuan plates uh, and a series of figurines there. The wreck, of course, is not unique. It comes from a whole series of other wrecks that have been excavated around Southeast Asian waters in the last 30 years, which Mike Flecker has been involved in. Uh, in, including the Bilitung, where he was a member of the team that uh, measured out the uh, ship's hull and enabled its reconstruction as an Arab Dao. Flecker has also dug at Tanjong Simpang uh, and a couple of these other wrecks along the east coast of Malaysia. I think he did the Bintuan one and the Intan and the Java Sea wreck here. So, uh, our finds is the latest in this long series of maritime archaeological excavations. I move on now to having talked about what we have done, the sites we have excavated. I move on now to talk about what have we found, recovered here. And basically, the categories are Chinese ceramics, uh, local earthenware, these are your low-fired cooking pots, and they constitute 50% uh, of what has been dug up. The other 50% are the Chinese ceramics, and then a smaller amount of uh, metals, Chinese coins, uh, fish hooks. These were largely from the site at the corner of Parliament House, just at the entry, uh, turning the junction between North Bridge Road and Hill Street. Uh, my late colleague Shah Alam uh, wrote a PhD, uh, MA thesis on this there. And of course, there are glass beads. I will now only focus largely on the ceramics there and briefly mention the earthen wares. I should also mention that uh, this is what has survived in the archaeological record. 
there's a lot that has not survived, and we know that there was a lot of trade in textiles, and so for those you may know, probably more in Indian textiles than Chinese silk. It's a misnomer to call that place that we are part of the Maritime Silk Road. Silk was not the major commodity, more Indian textiles. Foodstuffs, whatever was transported in those large number of jars did not survive. But we know they did because from one shipwreck, we dug out bits and pieces of messy stuff, analyzed it, and confirmed it was fermented fish sauce. Uh, timber, a lot of timber was coming out, exotica, like the hornbill cask, medicinal plants. So, Chinese ceramics. Um, there are two categories here. First is the high fire, very fine uh, ceramics, of which the top of the range is the blue and whites. They are what I would call the Louis Vuitton of ceramics in the 14th century when they were being produced for the first time at the kilns of Qingdezhen, when cobalt uh, could be brought over more easily across the uh, caravan routes of Central Asia from Persia. And the Chinese uh, potters at Qingdezhen were able to mix up a glaze that they painted on the white pots and when fired, uh, produced that beautiful blue design. Uh, of course, the Chinese potters knew that if you had put in iron ore, it would become black and brown, which they had done with the Chichu ware for centuries uh, before that. So, we, Singapore is already a major importer of this brand new, much desired blue and white wares from 1328 onwards, when the earliest of these uh, blue and whites were being uh, discovered or written out here. Um, a large number of what's called white ceramics, uh, bright as silver, which the Chinese uh, describe as bright as silver, white as snow. They're basically Qing Pai and Shu Fu wares. And finally, the green grey celadon, the majority of it, and the stoneware jars. Let me now go into a bit more detail. So, this is the underglazed blue and white. This is what we found in 1984, and it is a part of this thing there, this uh, wine stem cup, and quite clearly the prototype are uh, the gold ones that the great Khans, uh, Genghis Khan, were all drinking their wine out of. So the Qingdezhen potters were already producing this for not only the courts of uh, Kublai Khan, but also for export wares, and we, whoever was living on Fort Canning, was also drinking wine out of these same wine cups. And uh, what is interesting here is that the Tomasic wreck contained a significant amount of these blue and whites. Mike Pleck has concluded that he has never seen that amount of blue and white in the wrecks he had in the previous lay, and the inference is that Singapore was a major import center for blue and whites here. And together on Fort Canning, this is the top of Fort Canning, some 10% of the ceramics there are blue and white. Uh, these are the celadons, the green celadons that were produced in huge amounts in the kilns of southern China and at Zhejiang province there. In Around Fort Canning, the top and more the foothill areas, they constitute 60% of the celadon, of the ceramics that have been found. And also on the uh, Tomasic wreck, these are all celadons from the Tomasic wreck. And there are these white wares produced in large quantities for export, and you are both at the high end and the low end. And let me now move on. Again, these uh, low-fired uh, ceramics are basically your jars, your big dragon jars today. So they're in two categories. One is a very heavy, thick jars, uh, which were used to store, cook, or process foods from fermented uh, soya sauce to other dishes. Yeah. 
and transport them around. This is what we have found in great quantity in and around Port Canning and Southeast Asia and the seas. They are the equipped. When they were first found, way back in the 60s, and the archaeologists looked inside, they found mercury. So they thought this was for transporting mercury. But the quantities in which they are being found, I told John, if they were bringing that amount of mercury into Singapore, either for medicinal purposes, like in Vedic medicine, or to smelt gold, then the people of Singapore would have died of mercury poison. <laughs> or we never found that amount of gold. Uh, John still calls them mercury jars, but I think we have to go with the term now being used, small mouth jars, the equivalent of our glass bottles today to bring in everything from wine, the Chinese wines, to sauces and whatever else. So look at these as the equivalent of the glass bottles. They come in all sizes but are fairly standardized. And the jars. So you got the buff jars, the very thick, heavy ones, solid. I think these are what we call, some of us remember, as the salted egg jars here that we use today. And the other ones are the more lighter, thinly potted jars, bigger, that would have been able to store only the lighter stuff. So if you go downstairs to the, here downstairs, you would see a display of these jars there. The tall ones and the more solid, smaller, heavier ones. So, the local earthenwares, this is 50% of the stuff found, too much. And they are your everyday cooking pots, jars to carry water around, the drinking water and all of that. And they were imported from as far as the Isthmus and South Sumatra. We know this from one of our colleagues having done a spectrographic analysis of their contents and compared it and confirmed that some of these would have come from Southern Thailand. The shapes and forms remain very much unchanged since uh, Neolithic times. So, what conclusions can we draw? I would like to give you a bit more time for the Q&A. First and foremost is that the amount of stuff. Uh, when I say, when we all say several tons, it's not the metaphoric several tons. It is the literal seven tons. From the land alone, we now, I think we have got about 10, 11 tons of stuff, uh, making it one of the most well-documented uh, port settlement sites in the Straits of Malacca. Now you've got to add 4.4 tons from the Tamasic wreck there. So really that's a lot of stuff and all of that confirms what the Salatus are Salatin or the Malay annuals as we used to call it, uh, described Singapore as a great city yeah. Where, to which uh, traders from the region flocked to. So the Chinese ceramics alone makes a point that uh, this was a major regional entrepôt where local products from your tortoise shells to your medicinal products, timbers, were brought into Damascus uh, for re-export to China and from the Chinese side, the ceramics were then brought in. Um, but, and this is, I'll come to it in the next slide there, the issue of what was the nature, how was this trade conducted? And finally, the third conclusion we can draw is that the archaeological evidence quite clearly states that this settlement was founded in the, somewhere in the late uh, 13th century, uh, 14th century, 1300, and after 1390s disappeared. There was no further evidence of it there. The evidence runs out. So, for John, the conclusion is that, and all of us we accept, is that uh, Damascus was only a 
century old phenomena. Um, as we can discuss afterwards, actually here, the textual evidence suggests otherwise there. Let me now do a bit more of this here. Yeah? So, what have we reconstructed from the uh, archaeological uh, evidence, the distribution, is that we can now conclude that quite clearly whoever was the Raja was living right at the top of Fort Canning. Uh, Dr. John Crawford is very clear. He saw the remains of 14 pillar posts there, which suggests, as Dr. John Crawford correctly inferred, a royal or religious site. And the amount of blue and white there suggests that probably it was almost certain that the Rajas were living there and drinking their wines out of those uh, wine cups. And we have concluded that uh, around there, at the Kramat, where is that now? Sorry. was where we found the uh, evidence of glass being melted to make beads and uh, bangles there. Then down the hill was where the uh, rest of the settlement was, all within the wall that is marked out there. And the port was somewhere along there, the, the, uh, where the harbour. So my colleague Derek Heng is now trying to fine-tune this from looking at specifics of the amount of celadons, white wares, and other stuff. Were there certain areas like the, uh, like the cathedral where the upper-class merchants would have lived? And was there a market, open market here, where stuff was being traded? So that's where we are with looking at what more we can infer from the archaeological distribution. So we can speculate that that riverfront looked like Kampung Bugis in the late 19th, early 20th century, you know, a front of uh, houses on stilts to which the traders brought their stuff and unloaded it. Maybe something like this on the Saigon River. They came here and unloaded it into the warehouses. We don't know. We can only speculate that this is the probability. Uh, now the next one, the unanswered question before I conclude. So, how was trading done at Tamasic? Was it small-scale peddling barter trade that continued in Singapore way into 1965 and post when Indonesian barter traders uh, rode across from Bintan, came across in a little boat from Bintan and Batam with their bags of charcoal, salt fish and whatever else to trade. As in these uh, pictures here, these photos here, this is how they would come. Was it that way? And on the Chinese part, the Chinese traders would each have their little pile of uh, celadons, get onto the ship and come to Singapore, set up their stall and do a little pasa malam, so to speak. That was what we thought. And this certainly is the way trade was conducted in medieval Europe at the point of time, fairs. And in Java, as the Dutch found it, we end fairs where the merchants, the traders, the farmers would come. But I think here the shipwreck evidence is forcing us to rethink. You go downstairs and you look at the Belito cargo. That's not small scale trading. When you got plus 50,000 Changsha plates neatly packed into a boat, into the hold of a boat. You know, that's mass produced stuff and uh, raises questions. So, who funded the production of 50,000 plates and loaded it onto the ship, which fortunately, unfortunately, sank for us to recover today? So, when you look at the Tamasic wreck, you've got 4.4 tons of ceramics there. That's not 20, 30 
Chinese merchants climbing on board a junk or a boat in Guangdong or in Quanzhou to sail to Singapore. That somebody going with a lot of money to the kilns in China. Okay, here is it. I want ten thousand of that. I want five thousand of that. That's the sort of scale we are trade we are talking about. So, how was that four and four tons of ceramics order made and paid for? And if we are talking about Pasar Malam in Singapore on the Singapore River, Tamasik, the Padang, where how do you unload 4.4 tons of ceramics and sell it there? It's not going to be a Pasar Malam operation. So we don't know. This is all unanswered questions. You come to Singapore, you unload that. What happens after that? Obviously, we know it's going out. So when you go to the diet longhouses, you still see some of these green celadon plates as family treasures up there. So, so on that note, let me leave you with these unanswered questions that the archaeological uh, evidence has uh, raised and enabled us to say that Singapore, Damascus, was a great centre, a great emerging uh, port city, but there are still a lot of issues that the archaeology cannot answer. And on that note, I think we have got about 10 minutes, 11 minutes for any questions and answers. Thank you, Professor Kwa. Uh, we'll be passing around the mic, so please just raise your hand and give a brief introduction on your university or uh, affiliation. Hello, I'm Eric Wee. I'm Matthew's father. <laughs> also very interested in this subject. Uh, Professor Kwa, in, your, in the introduction uh, to studying uh, Singapore history before 1800, you mentioned that there's a gap in the archaeological record between approximately 1650 and 1800, and so I'm wondering um, the possible reasons for this. Is it simply because we haven't discovered uh, many artifacts from this period, or was there actually a uh, great reduction in the, 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 the volume of trade in this particular place in that period? What, what, what is your <laughs> feeling or speculation about that? Well. I'm not an archaeologist, so I can here be critical and say that that is a major limitation of the archaeological evidence. For the archaeologist, no shot, nothing happened. But as Peter Borschberg and I would confirm, we have been arguing that is not the case. So you got a bunch of Orang Lao actively trading in Singapore in the 15th, 16th century. But these Orang Lao they are, you know, we look at them today as uh, marginalized communities, but in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, they were a dominant community, a powerful force, the uh, navy of the sultan. So they would have been traders, but as nomads, they have left nothing. They were living on the water, they were living on boats. When the boat sank, that's it. So, the archaeologists will not find any evidence of Orang Laut, like Blakang Mati. We can speculate, Blakang Mati was the home of the Orang Laut community, who buried the dead there maybe, but there's no evidence. So does that mean that because there's no pot, nothing happened? No. So this was John Nixick's dilemma. He found it difficult to say that uh, since he had no part to show that there was something happening in Singapore after the 14th century when Malacca was founded, therefore nothing happened. Then he goes and digs some more and he finds a Ming pot. Oh, okay, uh, that's it, uh, there was a Ming settlement here. And so now I think John makes it, Peter, he's saying what, it's 1650 now? Yeah, he's extended to say that there was a settlement until 1615. So it all depends on where you look and what you find here. It's the same with, as Peter will tell you about the archival evidence. It depends on where you're looking for what you're looking there. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, I see another hand there. Yeah, I'm Suhail. I'm currently doing my PhD final year um, at the university in the UK. I, I would like to ask, Prof, you presented a dilemma, you know, whether it's uh, what existed in the settlement was small-scale peddling kind of trade or um, mass, in, um, sorry for the anachronistic term, you know, industrial kind of production. I was wondering, you know, they may not be mutually exclusive. Is that correct, Prof? Do you think that the settlement in the 14th century was complex enough to actually accommodate both the mass production side of things and also the small-scale regional peddling that's going on? Thank you, Prof. Well, that one there is something that my other colleague, Derek King, is puzzling about. Um, if I understand correctly, this is the archaeological modeling of the port settlements or the archaeological finds. What does it say? So, John Nixick argues that it was what the economic anthropologist Carl Pauline said is a port or trade, which means that it was the interface between traders from outside coming and then they meet with traders from the interior coming. Um, the alternative, of course, Modeling here is Bennett Bronson upstream, downstream there. Uh, Derek is, I think, working on a new, looking at a new modeling of the archaeological data. So it, here is an open question as to how and which archaeological tradition you want to go with to interpret the data. At this point, the, my colleagues are out, and so you have to wait for the uh, next edition of 700 years to see where Derek is going to take us <laughs> with his interpretation of the data. I am Effie from uh, a variety of institutions, including NMS and ACM. My question has to do with family life in the early settlement here in Singapore, because I understand that merchants who came from different parts did not bring their families with them. Sorry, I'm not hearing you very Family well. life. Huh? in Singapore mm. uh, in the 1400s, 1300s. Mm. So the merchants who would come from China, for example, they would not bring their families with them, would they? Or would they actually settle here, the Chinese merchants? So we have a case of Chinese merchants with families living here and also uh, possibly Malay or South Indian settlement here as well. So how do the two interact socially? If we have any idea. Well, I think Prof Wang would be the best person to answer that. <laughs> Whether the Huashang traders, which he has studied in great depth, uh, brought their families out with them. Uh, if I understand you, Prof Wang, you would say unlikely. And that is why you get this whole phenomena in the 19th century of... Uh, males in the settled families with no women to marry, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, that is the interpretation that uh, the traders came out singly. Um, but I think you ask a more profound question there, which again, Prof Wang is best. But let me speculate that uh, when the Ming dynasty closed trade, overseas trade and restricted it to tribute trade, the Chinese traders who decided then to venture overseas, especially from the uh, southern Fujian coastline, which is a very poor, geographically poor, difficult terrain, they had no choice. I mean, Fujian was, what, 80% rocks, as I remember. So you really had to look to the sea. And when you are not allowed to go out to trade by the Ming, Dynasty, and you went out, you couldn't come back, then uh, overseas, what did you do? You brought your families with you or you married overseas. So there's a whole different story here of these Chinese communities who were forced, or traders who were forced to migrate and could not then return to China. But maybe when Prof Wang stands up to give his speech, you can ask him to confirm whether I'm correct here. Yeah. Yeah, any last questions? Uh, otherwise, I stand before you and lunch. <laughs> <laughs>